Okay. Thank you so much to everyone who's um, joined us. My name is Shelmith. I am based in Nairobi. I am one of the Africa R, um, part of the Africa R leadership team. And we are so grateful that you've joined us today. We are facilitating this tutorial as Africa R. So if you've been following the Use R tutorials or workshops, you'll notice that different groups have been um, facilitating different tutorials. And we are so glad that North Africa will be facilitating this tutorial and it involves Egypt R, some friends from Algeria and our ladies, Algiers. And again, we are grateful for this opportunity. We are going to be speaking, up, or rather we are going to be hearing about Periscope and Canvas Express, uh, creating an enterprise big data visualization. The Periscope R package is a toolkit built specifically to address the need to develop the need of developers to produce enterprise grade shiny applications. And we are going to be hearing from a team from Aggregate Genius and I'll pass the button over to Dr. Connie who will be leading the team um, for further introductions. Thank you. Thank you so much Shomith for having us here. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll just start with the housekeeping items and then we can move on. I uh, just want to remind everybody that there will be um, a large number of people on the phone line. So keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question directly. Um, we have a whole team of people that are helping us with this and I really appreciate all of their help. Um, Omnia is the person to direct uh, technical questions and any questions you have during the session that maybe um, uh, you would want to have answered. Um, and we will try to answer as many of them live as possible. Um, and uh, I am not directly monitoring questions or I wouldn't actually get the presentation done. So please send your questions to Omnia. We do have a closed captioner here, thanks to use R. And so if you um, would like to view the captions, um, you can just turn them on in Zoom with that closed caption button. And um, just as a reminder, the session is being recorded and will be made available publicly along with the slides. Um, it will be edited so that the live coding pieces are not um, a part of the recording that, that is distributed. So if that makes you more comfortable interacting during the live piece, you know, feel free, um, but you will you know, have this for your reference. And, and with that said, I'll actually introduce myself. So my name is Connie. Um, I am the CEO of Aggregate Genius. We are a small, um, completely remote distributed company on the west coast of Canada. And my background is as a computational chemist originally. So uh, I've uh, moved into the R world and we run a small company that uh, provides uh, enterprise grade shiny services as well as full stack um, analytics um, development. We have a couple of our, uh, our colleagues here on the call today to help us out, Todd Brett and, um, and Kaylin. So uh, they are also helping to field questions behind the scenes and I appreciate them being here. And again, of course, I appreciate the, uh, the North Africa team as well for sponsoring this and supporting us. So we'll get started right away. I have a lot of content, um, but not a lot of slides. So you'll be uh, thrilled, hopefully, that most of this is interactive. But we are going to, during this session, create an enterprise grade big data visualization application in a few hours. So luckily it won't take a whole day. <laughs> And uh, this has been sponsored by Use R 2020 and was going to be a live workshop. So although I can't meet you all in person as was intended due to COVID, I do hope you all are well. And I look forward to interacting with you through our questions in our session. So with that, um, I will get started. So I wanted to just um, touch briefly on the problem domain. So enterprise grade shiny application. So, so why a shiny application to start with? Um, really, it's an invaluable resource uh, in addition to charts and um, static reports on, on analysis and data sets, right? Our world is becoming more and more visual and it's a really nice way to see what you've done when you're doing an analysis um, and to let your users actually interact with it. Um, from an enterprise perspective, what does that mean? So um, 
you know, when you're in a big company, there's uh, competing interests, stakeholders, analysts, the business's interests, and they want to make everybody happy. Right? They need to keep their employees happy, they need to keep their stakeholders happy, and they still need to make money. But there's some kind of some issues when you take something like a shiny application and you bring it into an enterprise. So when you're in an enterprise um, and a big company, you have to have applications that uh, if they're going to be used by a large number of users or your customers, for instance, let's say they're customer facing, they have to be scalable, they've got to be performant, they have to be safe. Um, they need to be consistent. This is your face to your customer, to your stakeholders, to your shareholders. And so they need to be professional. Um, and this is kind of problematic because you know, we're used to applications developed in the world by developers. Um, by people with computer science degrees, with user interface degrees, with human user interaction degrees that do studies and, and know how to build applications that meet a lot of these enterprise needs. But shiny applications are developed by analysts, um, largely people focused on science and analytics and insights and results. Right? We want to get those numbers out and the charts and show people our, the cool stuff we've done with all of the great algorithms we have. And um, we can do that with a shiny app. But, you know, and, and this works fairly well and we can put some really great applications together, but we also have another problem that's kind of crept up along the same time. And that is that data sets get bigger and bigger, which is fantastic. We have more and more data, um, but we're relying more and more on visualizations. And so not just applications, but visualizations and big visualizations and big data. So we're going to kind of address both of those issues today um, to some extent. Right now, I'm not providing you with a panacea to all your problems, but hopefully I can get you started. So um, one of the things I get asked very often is, so what's an enterprise shiny app look like, right? What is, um, so, you know, I've seen shiny apps and I've seen, you know, apps at our studio conference and I've seen apps on the web and, you know, I see all these shiny apps, but what does it mean to be an enterprise app? So give me an example. So, you know, what makes it an enterprise app beyond the fact that a company sponsors it? So usually enterprise apps have some complications beyond normal shiny issue complications. So usually the data set is really big. I'm going to show you an application where the data set is very wide and very tall. Um, and the users want to do things like filter and segregate on both rows and columns. So it's a big data set. They want to be able to do interactive filtering and segregation, and they want to handle data sets from different sources. And those data sets, if they're from different sources in an enterprise, they usually have different pipelines, results, you know, formats. Um, it's, uh, you know, one of those, you're bringing a lot of uh, fruit together to make a fruit basket and you're not bringing oranges together to make a bunch of oranges. So, um, and then of course, you have the access of non-developers using the app um, and quality assurance and things like that. So we, the app I'm going to show you is called Single Cell Viewer. It is out there in public. Uh, we did release a public version of it. And um, this application itself needs to visualize a large number of points interactively on the charts. Um, and it has a wide variety of charts and number of charts. And it is also allows the user to do a small but very heavy duty analysis. So there's something called differential expression in the biological world. And this application allows the user to do differential expression analysis, um, which is, a little unusual for such a, a large shiny app because on the fly analysis on a large data set can be very difficult because the user has to wait for it. So you have to balance the time it takes to get your analysis back versus the user experience on the front end. And then of course there's that balance I was just mentioning, that performance, not only with something like an interactive analysis, but you have to balance performance of your charts. So, um, you know, the user may be willing to wait a few seconds for a chart. In fact, we will show that today, but they also are not willing to wait five minutes for a chart to show up um, generally. So this is kind of, I wanted to show you what an enterprise shiny app looks like before we get started, because everybody sees the, the smaller examples on the left. 
Um, so this is that single cell viewer, and I will include the link to this uh, in the resources slide. You can go out and try it yourself. Um, there's a version of it out and hosted. Um, and so you can give it a, a shot. It's hosted on a smaller server, but um, you can see here on this plot, this is um, it, what you're looking at is a data set that's composed of cells and genes. So um, just to kind of give you an overview, there's a lot of different charts. Um, and you can imagine that this data set has um, about 20,000 cells in it, and each cell has um, quite a large number of genes. So as you can imagine, it's, uh, they're human cells. And so you can see that these, there's a large number of charts with large number of points on the charts. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you. This is the an interactive analysis portion of this app. And um, you can see here the user has selected two clusters of cells and is doing an analysis between the two that then comes back in this table below. So this is what, what I mean when I say an enterprise shiny application. Now this is used by internal and external stakeholders. Um, it's used by large numbers of people at a time. Um, so that of course there are deployment concerns um, and whatnot. But the idea is to give you a jump start on making an application that can visualize large data sets as well as, I guess I should not get ahead of myself, um, as well as you know, give you a framework for building an application that could become this big. Um, I think once you see the framework and how it's used, you'll use it for everything. <laughs> Personally, I love it um, and I did develop it. So I guess that uh, I'm a little biased there. One of the things that this session will do is probably introduce you to a charting package you may not be familiar with. So it's called Canvas Express. Um, and I wanted to provide you with a good option for visualizing large numbers of points. So Canvas Express was developed in about 2009 by Isaac Newhouse um, at Bristol Myers Squibb, who sponsored this work. And it was initially intended to visualize genomics data sets, cells, um, genes, right, um, and different um, other visualizations that were very large um, when other visualization packages didn't really scale for that number of points. Um, so it was released as an open source on, you know, in 2011, and it is um, an R package. And it's been around for a while. So we've been we're going on six years on this one, five, five six years. And um, the package itself, so the, the core of this package is written in JavaScript. So the, the package gives you live plots by design. So by design, it wants the user to interact with the plots um, once you make them. So it's not a charting package where you make a, a static chart and then show it to the user. It is literally you send the data to the web page and it builds the chart and then it can do a lot of things on that chart that you don't have to write as a developer um, things that users expect nowadays i would say five years ago they didn't really expect this so there are a wide variety of charts i just kind of wanted to put this up there so it's not a limited package it's a very very expansive package at this point um, and new charts and new chart types are being added to it um, continually. So I just kind of give you an idea of what is there to look at. And in general, this package provides much better scaling than packages based on, on SVG graphics. So it utilizes the canvas elements. So if you're a techie, that kind of means something to you. Um, but don't worry too much about it. But you can think of um, SVG graphics uh, in packages like V3 and Plotly. So it's, it works differently behind the scenes. Um, so for example, a 1 million point heat map in Plotly takes about 50 seconds to render. Um, in Canvas Express, it takes about eight seconds. Now, that still is a significant amount of time when you're looking at an application, but you also have to remember, you have to build in time, not only for that 50 or eight seconds, but you have to build in the sending the chart over the internet, um, the data points and things like that. So, um, it kind of gives you an, an idea, what does a 1 million data point heat map look like? It looks like this. So, and we will build a big chart. So with some, with some nice size data for, uh, for this tutorial. So um, I hope you enjoy learning a new package um, and have somewhere to go if you have large data sets um, that you want to visualize. 
The other reason that Canvas Express was um, created and has been um, focused on uh, for the last couple of years uh, to add features in this is the reproducible research. So as you might imagine at an enterprise and especially at a pharmaceutical company like Bristol Myers Squibb, being able to reproduce your research, that scientific principle of reproducibility is really, really important. Um, and so these ex charts actually build in full audit capability. The data, the configuration, and every modification of the chart can be captured. So that when somebody saves this chart, um, somebody else could go back and customize it again. They can see what somebody did to, to change it. And um, we're going to, I'll show you how to do that. So that's really, really nice in uh, an image. So it's all captured in the PNG. And so, um, uh, you know, if you are, are somewhere where you do research, where you're doing science, if you're doing analysis, so chances are you probably want to know, you know, when your user says, I got this crazy chart from your data, where it came from, what did they do? What did they change? Um, how did they get there from what you originally showed in the application? Right, so when you provide users with that ability to customize their charts, you'll also get the questions that are hard to answer. Like, wait, I got this chart. And you look at it and you're like, wow, I wonder how you got that. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, this gives you the capability to go back and be like, oh, you changed this. And then you set this setting and then you change that and you filtered your data this way. And yes, you can filter it right on the chart. So, we're going to get to the interactive portion soon, I promise. Um, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background on Canvas Express visualizations. Just like any charting package, it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, and since it was designed for very large data sets in the genomics field, um, it, it applies to any field, but it, the data format is tabular, um, but three-dimensional. So um, you can think of a data table, but a data table with extra information. So it actually utilizes both the column and row names to cross-reference the data sets. And uh, you'll see this when we, when we live code. Um, the charts are built using named options, which I will show you. And the order is your personal preference or style. You'll kind of get into it yourself and, and build your own style as you use these charts. Luckily, there is a ton of extra information at the website. Um, canvasexpress.org. There's examples there. And since this is a JavaScript package, if you write Java applications or Python applications and you want to bring in the, the JavaScript library separately, it is not limited to R. So if you have pipelines that are hybrid at your enterprise, for instance, maybe you use R for research and analysis and then also use it for, you know, and then use something different to build your enterprise applications, which is still fairly common you can still build these charts without R, but you can build them in R. So um, that's great, but you'll see that this website is super rich. It has you know, full API documentation and it has a ton of examples and each example has both JavaScript and JSON and R uh, code that goes with it. So you can just grab it right out of the web page, drop it right into our studio and create the same chart, explore the data. So that's a um, really, really helpful resource uh, that I kind of point you to. So there's a couple of terms. Since the data format is three-dimensional and tabular um, and uses both row and column names, variables are the rows. So if you hear me say variables, so you can think of row names as the variable names. And samples are the columns. So sample names are the column names. And that one takes, um, if you're not a biologist, it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, annotations, so they, it means just what you think it means. Um, it is extra information. So you can add extra information about the rows or the variables or the columns or the samples of the data set. So for instance, maybe your variables have some additional information. We'll talk a little bit about why it's done this way when we get into the code. And you can either have annotations or not. So that extra or extended information is going to be up to your data. Okay, you guys see the slides, perfect. There's a little bit of lag there. Okay, so we've seen a basic chart and you know, not very exciting at this point. Uh, bar chart, right, it's pink. 
it has some numbers on it. Um, but we've seen the data set. And so what I wanted to do was show you kind of do a quick rundown of the most commonly used options. And that's more for your reference than anything else. And you'll see them used. We're going to go back and we're going to customize that chart and make it look awesome and make some more charts. Um, because uh, we certainly don't want to just have a bar chart in our application. So you have to get your data into the chart. So that's put in with three different variables, data, which is the main data set of our application. And that was what we used to create our bar chart, sample annotation and bar annotation. That's where that, that, um, uh, that's where that kind of terminology comes into play. Um, and so, you know, when I say sample annotation, bar annotation, you know what's going on. And when the documentation says that, you, you understand that that is sample annotation is extra information on the columns, bar annotation is extra information on the rows. There's the graph type. The sky is almost the limit. There's a ton of different types of charts you can make from pie charts to word clouds to network diagrams. Um, there are a ton of really cool charts. Um, and we're always adding more. Uh, the graph orientation, right? Do you want it horizontal or vertical? Um, things that you always need to put in, in my mind, for a good chart, title, subtitles, the axes titles, tell your user what they're looking at. Um, the theme. So there's about 10 predefined themes. Um, so if you don't want to have to set like, you know, all the different colors and stuff each time, you can use one of the predefined themes. Um, data point size. Transparency, uh, always a big one with uh, big data sets. Um, and then there's a, a special uh, uh, option that's called scale font factor. And it's a great way to resize some of the text, but not all of the text, right? Let's say your title is really big and you want your axis titles to be smaller, right? But just a little bit smaller, we're gonna do that. And then of course you can move your legend around it's always a good idea to have a legend if it's not obvious on your chart what you're viewing. So there's a ton, and there's more. There's, there's more. Um, there's a save file name. And when your user downloads your chart, it should have a good file name. Um, it will, the program and the, the package will assign a file name. But honestly, um, you know, we were using that, um, and we will set a custom file name for ourselves. But, um, you know, the chart we just made, it makes more sense to have that be you know, frequency underscore age, or, you know, maybe the name of the data set underscore frequency, right? Um, you know, so it can start with something that makes sense to your user. So they don't have all these files in their download that they don't know what they mean. Um, so this is the Canvas Express main website. If you hit the homepage, it looks like this. Um, and there are a ton of examples. So the biggest place that I tend to go, even I, I do, right? And I maintain the Canvas Express R package, but I still go out here and I look at these examples. There are tons of examples. They're by chart type. So if you, you know, um, are taking a look and you want a contour chart, you want a dot plot, a facet chart, right? You're looking at, you know, it, these are all of the different chart types and they have a ton of examples. And usually what you can do is find an example that um, that you, that is similar. Maybe you want to label a point like this. So this is uh, called a decoration. So you can decorate your chart. Um, and you would find a chart and then you can view the R code for it here with this button. Or you can of course scroll down here and it'll talk about the data set, the configuration, and here is the R code for this chart. And so you'll see the decorations, you'll see how to add, you know, additional things like a citation, how to set the different axes, right? Um, so this is a very, very information rich place to go and look for your, um, for, for, for help, right? Uh, when you're going to create a new chart. And you'll see here, obviously, these are same functionalities we have on our charts. Now the functionality that's shown on the chart depends on the chart type. So you'll notice that for this chart, there's a lasso. And that's actually to allow you to select you know, points without, um, without a square, right? So I just selected these three points. Um, but, you know, you can, there are tons of examples, like this isn't just one scatter 2D. You can, you know, go see other plots that are, you know, richer, that are based on different data sets. Um, and this is the place where I would send people to go for help. And it's where I go for help. Um, I don't remember everything about the package. 
There's a documentation section as well. Um, and then there's the APIs, right? So this will walk you through some of the documentation. Um, and then there's the API. So the API itself is all of the options that are generally exposed. So if you're, for instance, looking for, hey, I need to set that save file name. How do I do that? What can I set it to? Which charts is it you know, used in? This is, this is the option name, and then you would set it to a value, a string value, right? Um, you know, maybe you need to tag your chart. Maybe you want to change the theme. Here's the themes. So, um, and we will do this. So I wanted to show you the website just briefly so that you, you know where to go on the website for help. Um, the website is the latest and greatest version. Um, the R package trails behind just slightly. Um, I, our team at Aggregate Genius maintains the R package and um, we run tests on it and we make sure everything you know, is still working and we, we put out those updates to CRAN. So, um, that is, you know, and you're welcome to check out the package yourself uh, and contribute if you if you um, find the, the the time. Awesome. So let's uh, let's take a look at a scatter plot. Um, scatter two. Okay. I want to look at a more rich scatter plot. So let's say we've got this scatter plot. Okay, and this is the typical um, cars data set, and you'll see the cylinders here, six, four, and eight, and you've got your, your regression lines on here. Um, you can go ahead on this chart, and if you would like to, you can facet it by um, the, uh, where is it? Segregate, sorry. Sorry, switching gears. Uh, so you can segregate it by cylinders. What if I want three charts where each cylinder is on their own chart? Right, so I can do this right on the chart. Now you can preset it up, and you can fat, you can go ahead and segregate it initially. But your user can also do this, which is really really awesome. If you take a look at that single cell viewer app, you could, for instance, facet that front chart where it shows all of the genes and all of the cells by gender. So that's um, one of the uh, the annotations for that data set is to look at cancer cells from males and females. And so the user can do it. Um, you can start this way, and then you can even bring it back to and remove the segregation um, and bring it back to the original chart. So that is a capability that's on chart and everything that's on chart, you can use to set your chart up for your user initially how you want. Um, and that, you know, that. So we're gonna jump right back into a topic that's usually much more development focused than uh, not but I want to provide you with um, uh, information about scoping in a shiny application. Since we talked about enterprise um, applications, I want to talk a little bit about scope. So in, there are three main scopes in a shiny application. There's global. It is accessible to all scopes and the UI, and it's only present when a global.r file exists. So if you're used to using a two file application where it's app.r and server.r, it won't, you don't actually have a true global scope, but um, that is global to everything. And then we have something that's called session global. It's accessible to all server sessions. And this becomes important when you deploy your app. That means that all of the user sessions, which are green here, are attached to this session global scope. So that means that those are shared across all the sessions. So there's no differentiation between user sessions. Um, and it is outside of that server function in a two file app, if you're used to two file apps. And then there's that session local, and that is inside of the server function in a two file app. And that is the stuff that the user changes. So if they change a widget, right, you want them changing their own widget value, not Joe's widget value, right? So if you have multiple sessions and you put your widgets, for instance, in the session global, if one user changes that other users will see the change. So Session local is generally where most of the code will go for a Shiny application because it's the part the user's interacting with. So we talk about it because the Periscope package is actually set up to make it very obvious where you are putting things. Um, so the global scope is meant for what, right? What would you put there? So what goes there in a Shiny app? Um, things that go in the global are things like library calls. If you use dplyr everywhere, put it in the global scope. You don't need to put a library call inside your UI. You don't need to put a library call inside your server file, right? 
um, things that are static, static data sets, things that nobody can change, that you're just referring to, anything that's a connection pool. Um, so if you have a database that you're connecting to, the pool would be global, and then your sessions would grab connections from it. Um, you have to be careful in the scope for environmental pollution. If you name a variable X and put it in global, everything will see X, and you have to be careful because you can have data and security exposure issues. So um, session global is a similar global type of scope. And in general, you would put common functions there. Um, you might put connections. Again, you could put static variables and data sets here instead of in the overall global. If you need to access them in your UI um, file, like to set up a UI, you would want to put it in global. But if you're not, if it's just behind the scenes, it would be in session global. Again, you have to be careful with this scope. Session local is where most things go. Most of your code actually goes there. It's a reactive context. So this is one session of the application, one browser. Uh, a lot of people say one user, but a user can have multiple browser sessions open. So it's one session, literally one window into your application. Uh, and you should always use the most restricted scope possible. If you can do it in session local, you should be doing it there. So, um, I'm going to introduce the package and show you why we just talked about that. So Periscope is a, an R package. It was built by scratch. I am the author of it, uh, and I do the maintenance of it, um, sponsored by BMS. It was initially developed uh, for uh, internal use, and it has been um, released publicly, and uh, a lot of people really like this. Um, it is a framework for developing these shiny applications in the enterprise. So, but it is not the solution for all of your problems. So Shiny App Development is still um, Shiny App Development. So um, it's also not a substitute or replacement for properly planning an application, um, but it helps you out. Um, it really helps reduce the amount of coding you have to do, we call it boilerplate, um, for common things. How do I style that button? How do I make this do that? Um, those are those boilerplate, the wheels on the bus um, items. Um, it creates a consistent UI experience. So you may or may not um, like the UI. Um, a lot of people like it. It gives you that dashboard-ish UI that works across a lot of different applications. And when you're in an enterprise or you have somebody with multiple shiny applications, hundreds, you know, developed by many different people, you need that consistent user experience. When they go into an app, they expect certain things to be there. Um, it'll also help with your scaling and scoping concerns for multi-user apps. Uh, if you've developed Shiny apps before, if you have any sort of group size, a lot of times you'll find that um, you make it, it works great on your machine, you send it to your friend, or whatever, your group, your PhD cohorts, your, you know, your colleagues, and two people try it at once and something goes way wrong. Um, and, and that's that scaling and scoping concerns. So this package makes it very obvious where things go and it keeps your scopes as safe as possible. So you know when you're making something global and you know when you're making it local to the user session. That's the biggest um, thing it does behind the scenes that really you, you will use it and you won't care about, except you really do care about it. If you've ever spent hours and hours trying to track down why something happens, um, this will solve a lot of that. Um, so you should give it a try. It's really flexible. It is not uh, prescriptive. It is your content can be as simple or as complicated as you need. Um, the content is what you focus on with this package. It's totally documented. Um, there's our help. There's vignettes. There's an example app, which I'm going to show you in just a second. And you can template an app and it gets you up and running really fast. And that's how we're able to do this workshop today and not spend three or four days building a Shiny application from scratch. So it is actively maintained and updated. This isn't some old or abandoned package. We are constantly adding things to it um, and improvements to it. So um, I'll just give you a quick rundown of conveniences. We're going to use the Shiny module if we have a chance to put in a file button, but there's a number of modules that are actually included with the package. And each of these modules has a dedicated vignette to show you what it does and how to use it. But the things that are really built in that you don't even have to worry about, um, you can just start your app and it's there and it will work, is the busy indicator. The tooltips. Tooltips are super easy um, to put on things. We'll add those. There's alerts that show up in the app in standard locations. There's URL parameter fetching. There's a reset button. 
If your organization requires logging of actions, you can log your users' actions. Um, a lot of places require that audit capability and for things like financial applications, that's really, really important. Um, and it will work on devices, so it's already responsive. Um, and you can have a left sidebar app, a right sidebar app, both or none. So the sidebars are up to you. That's one of the most more recent uh, features we've added. So um, it is very similar to programming traditional Shiny applications. So we, we tried to make this as familiar as possible. Um, and what will happen is, is we are going to put all of our content under what's called the program subdirectory. And this is critical. So files above that program directory are part of the framework themselves that runs the application. And um, each framework file has a header saying, hey, use this or don't use this, right? So that that way you know what is going on. The UI content is divided by location. So you'll see files like UI body, UI sidebar, and UI sidebar right. So um, we originally started with just the left sidebar, so it's just named sidebar. Um, we did not change that. I didn't want to break people's applications going forward. So you'll see these files, and you can imagine where your stuff goes by the name. Um, I'll show you how to use those. And then the server content, and this is that scope that we talked about. So there is a global.r, and that is where your global global, your real global stuff goes. There's server-global.r, and that is for your server global scope. Uh, and again, we talked about what goes in each. And then there's server local, which is where the majority of your code will go. This is an all reactive context in that file. And so this makes it very obvious where you're putting things in the scope. Um, usually you won't even tend to think terribly much about it. So, um, so I wanted to talk briefly about planning a Shiny app. So I've, I've jumped right on in with this example application, but Really, Shiny application development is, is less like our programming and more like enterprise, like you think of building Facebook or building um, an app on your phone, a game or something like that. You actually need to plan it. Um, and that becomes more and more important as your app gets bigger and bigger. Are you guys seeing my share? This sharing is paused. Uh, we're seeing planning a Shiny application. Yeah. Okay, in now presentation mode? Now, yeah. Yes, okay, fantastic. So planning a Shiny application doesn't have to be complicated. Um, I use this example on the right um, with my teams and uh, my teams are used to this. They call it Connie Draw. Um, you know, if you're a whiz at layout packages and PowerPoint, maybe you'll do it in PowerPoint or Word. But the idea is you kind of need to say, look, I have a screen and I'm gonna show the user some things. Um, I'm gonna put the controls here and these are the kinds of controls I need. And these are the kinds of data and visualizations I need, right? I need a table, I need a, some charts. I want them to kind of look like this. That's the idea. So some basic planning is really necessary. And a lot of times my planning looks like this. Um, you do need to think about your data. Um, where are you going to read it? How is it accessed? Um, is it static? Is it big? Um, is it gonna change? Do your users actually change it? Um, how you're gonna get it into your application. So you do need to think about these things. Um, you need to think about your user. So that's actually really important. Um, why are they using your app? Are they using it to explore? Are they using it to create reports that are given to their boss? Are they using it to find, you know, efficiencies in marketing results, right? You, you, you know, uh, campaigns or do a B comparison, right? Why is the user using your app? Um, and then you know, that kind of goes in concert with what controls are needed. Um, and then you pick your tools, right, depending on your app. So, um, and again, you have a toolkit. Maybe sometimes you need a hammer, maybe sometimes you need a screwdriver. Um, and so those are, you know, the tools that, that you can pick from, right? You know, the charting libraries are, you know, a whole ton of them. There's a whole ton of different table formats. There's a whole ton of widgets in Shiny, like a, a lot of really awesome things that you can add to your application. Uh, maybe your, your application is actually so cool and has such interesting charts. You need, you know, TensorFlow in there and you need um, custom D3 visualizations, right? So remember the sky's the limit on content, but you do need to kind of plan ahead. Um, and that's really what I'm saying here. So plan your layout, plan your styling. Um, 
A couple of notes on reactive programming and Shiny modules. So there's a difference in programming Shiny versus programming R. So R is a functional language and we're all used to going line by line, executing something, looking at results, executing something else, looking at results. And that's that functional language. But remember in Shiny, the user is not going to go in the order you expect. Um, the user is going to go in their very own order. Um, and that is tough, right? So it works much more like a modern application. It's reactive. The user does something, something else happens. But the trick is, is that not just one thing happens, lots of things happen. Um, and as your apps get bigger and bigger, more things happen and you have to keep track of what's happening. So keep that in mind, um, even though R is a, is, a, is a functional language, the pieces of Shiny are going to trigger other things to happen. Um, and then there are contexts. So there are places like that server local file that is reactive so that everything that goes in there can change and trigger something else to happen. So that means if you change a reactive variable, something else will probably happen. Anything that depends on it, um, unless you isolate it. So reactive variables include variables you define, and, and that's very useful, but it's not just an input and output in session. So, and there's whole blocks of code that can change. Um, and so just keep in mind that those, it's not just observes and you can restrict it with isolates, but you do have to plan ahead for if you change something and something else depends on it, it will change. Um, and the order of that change is not necessarily um, what you might expect all the time. Um, and I say that not as a dig or anything wrong with Shiny or, or R or the way that it's done. It's just that when you trigger an event, you know, when the, when the light stops at a road, you know certain things are going to happen. The cars are going to stop, the pedestrians are going to walk, but pedestrians all, are all individual. And so sometimes a pedestrian might walk faster than a car stops, right, and get hit at an intersection. So you just have to be cognizant of the fact that there's a whole chain of events that are going to happen. And if you need them to happen in a specific order, you may have to make them happen in a specific order. So, um, and I'll just briefly mention Shiny modules. Um, they are special little bits of code. They're not uh, particularly exciting, but they're just pieces that you don't have to write over and over and over again. And so um, in Shiny, it gives you a UI and a server function and um, you'll use it. I mean, this is no different than a button, right? You know, you know, my action button and then, you know, you, you, or, you know, an HTML output and then you render the HTML out. So modules are similar. Now module, modules did change in Shiny 1.5 and they, so when you're programming in the latest version of Shiny, keep an eye out for packages that have moved to the call server paradigm. Um, so that's a little bit different. You'll have to read up on it in R. Um, Right now, uh, Periscope is using the old uh, functionality. Um, it is not, uh, it, it, they don't go backwards and forwards. So um, at some point we'll have to switch over to the new functionality, but then everybody has to use the new functionality. Um, so that's a fairly new change. Okay. And, um, some debugging items that we actually already got to. And then deployment, you do need to think about where you're gonna deploy it. Um, RS Connect was mentioned. Um, that is where most enterprises and Shiny Server Pro will deploy their applications because it handles the scaling nicely. Um, remember, if you're using the free Shiny server, it is single threaded. So if you have 10 users connecting to one application, you are using one thread for 10 users and they all have to wait for each other. Um, as long as you scope it correctly, they won't interact with each other's sessions, but um, keep that in mind. So uh, it depends on your platform. Um, but this is uh, not a package that actually deals directly with deployment, but it is completely compatible with different types of deployments. Um, it is that inside part, this is directly dealing with Shiny. So there are other toolkits that deal um, with the um, with deployment specific. So I wanted to I will give you these slides, of course, and these have those resources on them that we talked about. Um, CRAN is the primary repository for these packages. Um, you're welcome to go check out the GitHub repositories as well. Um, I have put them on here, but remember GitHub, until it's actually uh, gone through the process of testing and out to CRAN and merged back um, and tagged, 
you will notice that uh, there may be some differences in GitHub, just like any other package that's in development. Um, and it may or may not work from GitHub. So please use the CRAN package when you're developing uh, Shiny apps and you'll find they work the best. Um, that single cell viewer that I showed you, it has a preprint publication. Um, if you wanna read about the science and why it was created um, and you can uh, check out the code and take a look at a, an enterprise apps code and you can try it out on our little hosted server at periscopeapps.org where we have hosted some shiny apps for people to, to give a try. Um, Canvas Express uh, is, is also out on CRAN and uh, you can check it out at canvasexpress.org. I have a couple of blog posts that you might be interested in, one on scoping, uh, one on Canvas Express visualizations, and then um, welcome to check out our company as well. Um, we're Aggregate Genius. And this would not have been possible without support from Isaac, uh, support from Bristol Myers, support from USR, our, our great uh, North Africa team, um, Africa R, Egypt R, Our Ladies Algiers, and my team, Todd and Kaylin, um, and of course, all of you. So I really appreciate your coming and staying, and hopefully you learned some stuff and want to go give it a try um, because it's the, uh, it's the coding part that's the, the fun part. So uh, I hope you've learned a lot and are ready to go create your next shiny application. So I am going to stick around for questions, of course, but I, I did get the, the warning that I was very, very close to the time. So. Um, Shometh, uh... um, thank you so much. This has been amazing, totally. And speaking personally, I love uh, your mode of presenting. It's so engaging. And the energy from beginning to the end is the same. Like, I can't even imagine we are almost going to three hours. Thank you so much. We are so grateful.